Hank, do you fill out a, a March Madness bracket? No, I don't. I catch up with it as it goes along. And uh, I'm an old school guy. I missed 20 years ago, and you actually could have two or three years to learn about a team. <laughs> I can't keep up with what goes on now. But I love watching it when it happens. But I don't like to bet on sports. I don't care enough. You don't care? I love sports. I have no desire to sports gamble, yeah. except for fantasy football. Do you play fantasy football? I do. That I do. I love that. How obsessed are you with fantasy football? A bit. Yeah, quite. I have like three teams, just too many, and I tried to quit one. Did you ever try to quit a fantasy team? Your friends get take it very personally and get yeah. really upset. I couldn't get out. I had uh, a sickness. I was in a 12-step recovery program with fantasy. <laughs> I, 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 it was bad. I, I was doing SportsCenter one night, and Keith Oberman was actually on camera. I'm off camera, and I'm trying to complete a trade that involved Alonzo Mourning and Stacy Ogman and Glenn Rice. And I'm doing that on the air. So I was in NBA Fantasy League. Oh. I'm on the air. It, it was bad. I would go to a draft. I'd go. I'd walk by a room at, at the mothership, and they'd have a draft, and I'd just go, oh, you guys starting? I walk in just to be in the draft. How many league? How many? How many leagues were you in at once? At, at well, your worst moment, okay. at your bottom. Golf. Yeah. NASCAR, baseball, basketball, football. Well, and only one in each, or multiple? Uh, I had multiple in uh, football, multiple in baseball, multiple in basketball. Well, that's, that is bad. That's, that's the worst I've ever heard. That's pathetic. Yeah. I had to stop cold turkey. I'll bet you did. Yeah. I bet your wife must have been thrilled with all of it. <laughs> The uh, show is called Brockmire, <laughs> premieres with back-to-back -back episodes April 5th at 10 p.m. Eastern on the uh, IFC channel. Yeah, they assure me that's a real channel. It is a real channel. Yeah. Okay, so. <laughs> explain how all of this came about with the legendary fictional broadcaster, baseball broadcaster, Jim Brockmire. Well, Jim Brockmire, and you are a big part of it, Dan Patrick, so thank you very much. One of the rules of being Jim Brockmire is you can't call anybody by their first name only. It's especially broadcasters. You are Dan Patrick, and you'll always be Dan Patrick to me. Um, <laughs> this voice fascinated me since I was a teenager. It's, uh, you know, I spoke to Bob Costas recently. He watched Brock Meyer and he loved it, and he named it perfectly. It's the generic baseball announcer voice. It's perfectly vanilla. It's especially what you heard in the 70s and 80s. I don't know why. It was also the voice that probably sold you the Ginsu knife <laughs> and other things. It's usually associated with middle-of-the-road hackish kind of announcers. But Jim Brockmire is a breed apart. And then you took part in the short. I always thought, do these guys always sound like this, including yeah. if they're freaking out or having sex or on drugs or whatever they're doing? And that's basically what the series explores. So this is Funny or Die is where it originally Yes, yeah, Funny or Die. Now, did, did Will Ferrell reach out to you to put that on that site? That's Will's site, isn't it? Funny that is Will's site, and I just met Will for the first time this year after being involved with Funny or Die for like eight years. No, by the time I did it, he had just created it and it was up and running, oh, okay. and there are guys there who run that for him. He's very involved, but I just, you know, one of the great things about Funny or Die is you have an idea like that. You just go to them, and they'll produce your short. It's awesome. Okay, but this series, Jim Brockmire is how old? Jim Brackmeyer is exactly my age, Dan Patrick. So he's in his... He's about to be 53 years old. Okay. Yeah. How racy is this? It's racy. I mean, it's, you know, like I already warned my elderly mom. Mom, you're not going to like this show. I'm telling you right now. You didn't like Book of Mormon, which she did not. <laughs> She's not going to like this show. Um, but what can you get away with on uh, IFC? Oh, everything. What can't you get away with? That's the great thing about... Uh, you curse a nudity? blue streak. Oh, nudity, yes. I mean, uh, is Jim well, no, Brockmire got, nude? I don't, yes, Jim Brockmire is nude. No, no. It's not frontal, but you're going to see his, you're going to see him from behind with nothing on, doing a victory lap, doing a Kirk Gibson around the bases, <laughs> which, come on, if you've scored with a man to Pete at home plate, that's what you're going to do, you know. Oh, wow. Which was what happens. Oh, wow. But it's about, you know, sex and uh, baseball and a lot of drinking. Which, you know, they all go together. I don't know if you've ever tried to watch baseball or have sex sober, Dan Patrick, <laughs> but uh, it's not a lot I, of fun. I can't watch baseball sober. <laughs> yeah, no, you have to be. Okay, yeah, but no. it, are you taking sort of a uh, a little bit from Harry Carey, a little bit Mel Allen? Like, are you creating a sportscaster, broadcaster out of... Again, the voice is just the generic one. It's I think the closest modern equivalent would be John Miller. Oh. But, uh, but no, but John Miller's a terrific... He's not a hack, 
but it's the vocal quality I say is closest. Um, but it's more just the generic vanilla voice, and then the jackets, Lindsey Nelson. I grew up in Met. Plaid. Yeah, and it's just more that sensibility. He's a fish out. He's a guy who, even though he was, he fell from grace ten years ago in '07. His sensibility is in 1978. You know, he's an old school baseball guy. How does he keep his job? Well, he loses it. Uh, he, he freaks out on yeah. the air, and then he loses. Well, he had it. issues with his wife. He walked in on his wife uh, in, as he would call it, flagrante delecto with another man. <laughs> had you know, he's the kind of guy that would have four or five, whoever, whatever beer was sponsoring Kansas City at the time. Yeah. But that day, he hit the Sazerac rye pretty hard, too. <laughs> and after a bottle of it, was in a blackout drunk, flips out on the air talking about his wife using a strap-on and whatnot, and <laughs> which is a belt that mommies wear to penetrate daddies, as he points out. I don't know. Can we say that? Oh, uh, we, we should probably. <laughs> no, this is yeah, an IMC. Yeah. <laughs> There's uh, nudity on this nothing show. Nothing wrong with the word penetrate. Come on. <laughs> anyway, so loses his job, spends 10 years out of baseball, and the series picks up with him trying to get back in. He's starting at the very bottom rung of minor, minor league baseball. He's Hank Azaria. He does a lot of voices, not just Brockmire, which appears uh, April 5th at 10 p.m. Eastern on IFC. Many voices uh, with The Simpsons. And uh, run down the voices here. Oh, there's too many to name. There. How many? By the way, Jim Brockmire occasionally appears as a Simpsons voice. We just don't call him Jim Brockmire. But my big guys are Mo, the bartender, uh, Chief Wiggum, Apu, the Quickie Mart attendant, comic book guy. I might as well do them as I name them. Why not? <laughs> comic book guy, Mo, I already mentioned. Apu, of course, is a wonderful man. Uh, Police Chief Wiggum. There's Cletus. He's a slack-jawed yokel. Um, Professor Frank, of course, Dan, was a wonderful man and quite a brilliant man. Um, Carl, homeless Fred Carl. Uh, you don't hear a lot from him. Uh, Lou the Cop, another uh, favorite of mine, a kind of obscure favorite, Lou the Cop. I want to talk about the process here of the voice. When you get a voice, get a character, uh, how do they marry the two on The Simpsons there? So this is called a tease is what this is. They will just hand us a script. Wait, wait, wait. This is a tease. Oh, it's a tease. Oh, Don't I, you understand? We're going uh, to break. Cut that out. Like, still to come. Dan, let me think about it for like two to four minutes, and I'll get back to you on it. <laughs> like, like, like Keith Morrison mm. on Dateline, when he gives you a tease. <laughs> ah. <laughs> oh, and by the way, Fritzy will do his Marge Simpson impersonation for you. Now, that's a tease. Yeah. Now, and I want an honest grade on, on it, okay? I'll give you an honest grade. Could he fill in... If, if, like, nine people got sick, <laughs> could he fill in as Marge Simpson? <laughs> all of that. All of that coming up right after the break here on The Dan Patrick. That's exciting. Actor, producer, writer, director, comedian. Oh, come on. All those slashes there? Uh, that, well, they were true at least at one time, yes. You got one more slash than Cranston does. He doesn't have comedian on his. Uh, and, and, <laughs> he uh, could and should. Although I was a stand I technically was a stand-up for about a year early in my career. So. How tough is being a stand-up comedian? Brutal. Absolutely brutal. Really, really hard. Did you need to drink before you went on <laughs> or need to drink when you got off? Uh, both. Uh, you know, before, during, and after. I lucked. I was very young, and I stumbled on stage at the Comedy Store in L.A. and didn't even realize it was an audition situation and got hired. Who was, who was performing? Back then, you, you, those were the days of, like, Pauly Shore and Andrew Dice Clay and Sam Kinison was still dominating then and uh a lot of guys you know came up through there and comedy store was a particularly brutal play i never got through my act i only got heckled mercilessly <laughs> yeah, it's true and i had no game i had no response i was young i didn't know anything and some older comedians took pity on me and said dude you can't just let the audience destroy you <laughs> you have to say some things back to them and they gave me a few like stock insults back. back yeah which I would use. So, uh, <laughs> Hank, give, you got one? Sure. Like, you'd say, sir, please, this is my job. I don't interrupt you at your job. When you're on your knees at the men's room oh, at the okay. bus station. That's, I thought we might be going there. <laughs> uh, Hank Azaria has a new show called you asked, Rock Mart. You I asked. know, I know. And as soon as it left my mouth, I said, no. Uh, premieres with back-to-back -back episodes April 5th at 10 p.m. Eastern on uh, the independent film show. IFC. IFC. Yeah. Most of this appearance is not going to be able to be shown. It's not. Sadly. Oh, no. well. Well, it's nice to see you anyway. Um, 
Is there maybe we should have Jim Brockmeyer on at some point, and and he's that's part of the show, so we can have me, you would be on for me to interview you. You mean as part of the series yeah. or just yeah. sure? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Well, sure. you're a very difficult man to book. We tried to get you. Yeah, I know. Last oh, I time. know. Oh, I know. I mean, we're very, lucky. very difficult. We caught you eight years ago when you did the short. We caught you in a little <laughs> career lull. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Explain the process with the Simpsons here. If you come up with a voice, or do they come up with a character and then they need a voice? How does that work? It is always the latter. They write the script and uh, then they cast it. You know, Harry Shearer, Dan Castellaneta, and I do most of the male voices on the show and they just divide it up. Well, each week we do like five or 10. And in the early days, there were many new characters each week. And you had to, I had to sit there and think about what voice would go with this character. And then over the years, you know, you accrue more and more characters and it's easier. And then it also gets easier just to kind of figure out how things should sound. Okay, they come up with a character. Right. Do you, do you see the character? Do you have a picture of the character? No. They describe the character? Yeah. Like, you know, I can remember, for example, Professor Frank. Let's take Professor Frank. Okay. They didn't have any specific voice in mind, but they cast me as it before they heard me do it. And I was like, you know, did, um, Jerry Lewis, I believe, did the original Nutty Professor. Well, that would be certainly a frivolous and entertaining way to go here. And I tossed it out there and did it that way, and they laughed. And if they laugh, you know, in comedy, that means it's going to work. <laughs> so, and then, you know, Dr. Nick Riviera, I'm like, well, I'd do a very bad Ricky Ricardo impression, or at least what I remember Ricky Ricardo sounding like. <laughs> so let's do that. And... Uh, <laughs> Did yeah, you exactly. know? So laughter ensued, and then that was it. Did you yeah. know a bartender who sounded like Mo? Mo was the first character I ever did, and that I, I auditioned for the show with that voice. And no, actually, I was doing a play at the time in L.A. where I was playing a drug dealer, a low-life guy, and I was doing a pretty bad Al Pacino from Dog Day Afternoon impression. And Al, now Al sounds like this, Al Pacino. Talks like this now. But back in the day, he was up high. He talked more like this, right? Michael Corleone talked like this. So I did that. And they said, we like that voice, but we need it to be a gravelly voice. So if you take young Al Pacino and you make him gravelly, that equals Mo the bartender. Does Pacino know that you're sort of paying tribute to him? I don't know. I, have, I've never, I haven't heard from Al. I once did a, acted with him in Heat. We did a scene together, and we both have the same birthday, interestingly enough, and we did that scene on our birthday. But in that, in that uh, scene, in, now, De Niro and Pacino never appeared together in, no, they did. in Heat? They had a scene together, actually, at Kate Manolini's. They shot the scene at okay. a, at a okay. restaurant, and they had this great conversation. Okay, I thought that, that that was the big thing, that they weren't on the set at the same time. For the most part, that was true. I think only in that one scene were they ever really together. Do you crank, uh, you know, prank phone calls? I used to, as in my youth, quite a lot. With these voices? Yes. Yes. But what would you, like, who are you pranking? Uh, I did one, they, growing up in Forest Hills, I was on the 14th floor. I could see out my window as a, remember the old days of phone booths? Hey, kids, yeah. for you kids at home, there used to be things called phone booths. <laughs> and you'd put money in them, and you'd have to actually call people. And uh, there was one I could see out my window, and I got the number of it. And I would call it. And, and when people were walking by it, and I would use the Brockmeyer voice. I'd say, like, you know, hi, this is uh, Madman Mad Manduzo from uh, WPAL. Hey, there's $1,000 hidden in the red Nissan Sentra right next to you, and you've got 60 <laughs> seconds to find it. And I watched people uh, attempt to rip apart a car. Um, and it was right near a police station, too, and my goal was always to actually get somebody arrested. <laughs> um, Fritzy does Marge Simpson, and... Uh... I, now, do people audition? When you meet people, do you have people who say, hey, listen to my impersonation or, you know, listen to my voice with Ned Flanders or what do you think of this? Occasionally. And they usually regret it. They go, you know, hey, I do a pretty good mo. <laughs> and I'll go, all right, let's hear it. And then they get a little panic to like, oh, I maybe shouldn't have said that. Now I'm doing it. All right. Uh, but yes, occasionally. I, I want you to be honest with Fritzy's Marge Simpson impersonation. This is emergency situation. <laughs> That somebody couldn't do Marge Simpson. All right. Fritzy? Let me close my eyes. All right, here we go. 
Oh, homie, it's so exciting. Hank Azalea is in the New York City Man Cave on the Dan Patrick Show right now. He's so buff and handsome. Did you know he has a new show called Brockmire? Premiering April 5th with back-to-back -back episodes at 10 Eastern on IFC? He's the cat's meow. And then the sisters might say, well, Who cares? You think I'm actually going to watch that? All right, first of all... That was unbelievably scripted. I mean, uh, you really, you really prepared that. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I wanted to make yeah, a good yeah. impression on you. I just wrote it's during like, the break. It's like you were auditioning like for Yale Drama School or something. <laughs> That's the first thing. Is that a compliment? Well, oh. I appreciate the plug. Oh. No, no. Oh, wow. I, I appreciate the plug. Without the plug, <laughs> what did you think? Well, here's the problem when oh, you do that. No. If you, if you, if you don't, if it's not set up, it's just off the cuff. Then it gets judged as if it's like a scripted piece of material that we really want professional quality from. That wasn't bad. You want my honest assess assessment? Yeah. Especially for a man doing it that was, uh, who's, you know, not a, not a, not an animation professional. Professional. I give you a C plus for that. Okay. I'll take that. It's passing. Right, you uh, take that. It's passing. It was passing. Let's put it this way. If we needed like somebody just to tempt the voice uh, for Julie then would come in later and do it, that'd be perfectly... <laughs> Acceptable. You would not throw anybody else off. Excellent. In the room by I, doing. I, I will take from Feel Hank's area. I will so, take that. And I, you know, I didn't mean to be, uh, you know, ungrateful. That I, I appreciate how much work you put into it. So. But Hank, <laughs> Hank's involved in the craft. I understand. You know, <laughs> he, he's he's an actor for it. You know what? C plus. That's what I he's can, trying to say. I understand. I, I'll take that. That's still a, it's a passing grade, and that uh, goes a long way in my. Yeah, mind. I mean, you know, that was a very nice way of saying keep your day job. <laughs> I uh, well. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to bring this up. You were in a movie Along Came Polly? Yes. Okay. I thought there were performance-enhancing drugs involved in your character because you were You're a not Speedo, the only one. and you are ripped. Like, you are... <laughs> you got a six-pack. Yeah. You're jacked there. Yeah. Is that all natural? 100% natural. But you're not the first person to ask me that question. One guy... It, randomly in L.A., somebody... I was at... <laughs> I don't know where I was. Some restaurant for lunch. Guy comes up to me and says, ask me that question. Says, you know, were you, were you, did you take steroids for a long camp, when you did a long camp And I said, no, I didn't. He went, yes, you did. And walked away. <laughs> okay. I was like, all right, well, then why ask me? Well, you had me? bigger arms back then, too. I guess I did. Where'd they go? Well, dude, I'm 53. I, mean, I was in the gym three times a day. Like, you know, a few times in my career, I've gotten roles where you're basically going to be, I think was naked in that movie. And it frightens you into the gym. And what else you have to do as an actor leading up to a movie? It's like I had a job that I'd actually go show up at. What about a nude scene there? Yeah, I mean, yeah. How so, is that? How does it work? Do, oh, you mean like doing a love scene? Yeah. Like a sex scene? Yeah. It's very highly, highly And awkward. who are you with? In that movie, I was with um, Deborah Messing. Yeah. We Thank like you. Deborah Thanks Messing. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, my buddy Ernie, who I'm about to see for lunch, who I grew up with in Forest Hills. Yeah. He l gets infuriated on the days when that's my job. <laughs> when it's my job to pretend to have sex with Deborah Messing or Kelly Lynch or Amanda Pete, who ever been fortunate enough to do that with. We like Kelly Lynch, too. Well, yeah, Roadhouse. And she's a lovely woman. Do you realize, do you know that story? Roadhouse about, is one of my favorite movies but of all time. Do you, pain don't hurt. Do you, uh, the Bill, <laughs> Bill Murray story? What's the Bill Murray story? Bill Murray and his brothers call Kelly Lynch's husband. Every Mitch is Mitch. Yeah. Every time the the scene is on where she's having sex, they will they'll, with Swayze. They'll call <laughs> Kelly Lynch's husband and say, uh, "Your wife's having sex with him." <laughs> this has been going I on can't for tell twenty you how much years. I love that story. It, it's been going on for two uh, twenty years. That's fantastic. Because I, I love Roadhouse. Oh, the, my favorite uh, story connected to having sex in a movie. <laughs> this is attributed it attributed it to Tom Hanks, but I I think. Some older actor said it before him. Before love scenes like that, he will turn to the actress and say, I apologize if I do, and I apologize if I don't. And that pretty much covers yes, it. Yes, it does. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's uh, Brockmire premieres uh, April 5th, back-to-back -back episodes at 10 p.m. Eastern on uh, IFC. He's Hank Azaria, actor, producer, writer, director, comedian. And uh, also, uh, I'm a longshoreman, uh, Patrick. I like that. Another slash in there <laughs> as well. Uh, congrats on getting Brockmeyer. Thank you. And truly, thank you for doing the short years ago. It, it made a big difference. It helped a lot. I remember you weren't sure if you were going to do this as a TV series. And I said, why wouldn't you? If, if you feel like you can, you know, 
wrap enough characters and have storylines there. And it was an interesting character that we've never seen. No, I would have loved it. It's just you never, nothing ever gets made. You never get to really do anything. It's 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 amazing we got to do this. So so April 5th on IFC, it's called Brockmire, Jim Brockmire. Brockmire. And uh, <laughs> thank you for stopping by, Hank. We Thanks for having it. me. The Dan Patrick Show, weekday mornings on Audience.